the people in the 1500s and later were just patting themselves on the back. So they were like, that stuff that happened in the middle when everybody was Catholic, forget about that. It was all superstition. We want to think about the ancient Greeks and ourselves. So that was called the middle period really early on. Like I think the late 1400s or 1500s, people calling it the middle period because they were like, let's just forget about that. People were dumb during that time. And we've continued to say that <laughs> even though mm. huge amounts of technological innovation was happening. People were, you know, reading more often, more books being circulated, more science, all this stuff happening. But it was really it was a propaganda thing. And we are still buying into it. We still think like the Romans were amazing. And then things got amazing after the Middle Ages. But the middle was all like blue filter and mud and blood. And that's not how it was. Are we? Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, welcome to the Here We Are podcast. I'm so excited. I'm dressed. This is my first ever getting uh, dressed up in something for the Here We Are podcast. It's been eight years, I think, I've been recording this show. <laughs> um, and this is my first time. We're talking about medieval times today. I am so excited. My guest joining me is Danielle Sabalski. So thank you so much, Danielle, for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and I love the outfit. Thanks. It has a, So I have another podcast called Mind Under Matter. It's a comedy and philosophy podcast I do with an artist, and we like make a lot of like weird culty things. <laughs> so we have this thing. Oh, uh, I love it. Does it have pockets? Tell me it has pockets. <laughs> it, no, but that's a really good idea. I mean, this is just a cape and a hood. It's like pretty... It's pretty weak. I mean, really, <laughs> I, I, next year we're going, we just did a, uh, we just did a whole um, like camp out festival and rally that was several days and um, science talks and music and comedy and a bunch of things. And so we got it. We, we decided we were forming a cult, but now <laughs> we need like real robes though. Yeah. This is just, this yeah. is, um, I saw, so Gosh, do I just skip to, I'm just going to skip to the thing that I want to ask you about first, even <laughs> okay. though it's not, it's not it, like I should be setting you up and everything, but you know what, <laughs> why don't you, why don't you tell people about yourself first and then that will give context to the question that okay. I have for you. So people can't tell that we haven't like rehearsed this, this is our first meeting completely. <laughs> They're used to listening to this show though. It's, it's the norm. Right. I am a medievalist, which means I spend my time studying and researching and writing and podcasting about the Middle Ages. So I spend my time on Europe between about 500 to 1500. So all that stuff about knights and castles and monks and all that, that is what I do for a living. Amazing. Are you, so I was excited to have you on. You got recommended to me by Athena Actippus, who I'm doing her uh, her ZAM zombie apocalypse medicine meeting um, conference, a fun way to do science communication in Phoenix in a couple weeks. And then we were talking off the air. Maybe it was on the air she mentioned you. And I was like, what? Medi I've never talked about medieval times on this show. <laughs> and it's the season for it. This is I'm I'm surprised you're uh, aren't aren't people hitting you up around this time with all of the like Renaissance fair stuff going on uh, um, everywhere? Not no? not right now. I don't have a lot of fair stuff going on right now, but I might not notice because I am at the end stages of writing a new book, so I'm kind of I buried <laughs> buried in it right now. You never know because sometimes like International Sloth Day is coming up. It's October 20th. <laughs> and every year I realize that too late. And then I try to get a sloth researcher. And that's the one time a year where everyone's trying to talk to a sloth researcher all at the same time. But I mean, forgetting about sloth day is the epitome of sloth day, don't you think? Uh, yeah, I always put it <laughs> off a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I'm going to I'm going to cut to the uh, whatever i'm not why i set this up it says in your it says in in the end of your bio mm -hmm. um that it says when not 
when we're not reading, writing, or recording, because you have your own um, podcast right. as well, uh, Danielle can be found drinking tea, doing Cav Magra, or sometimes building a backyard trebuchet. Yeah. Is that how you pronounce it, by the way, trebuchet? Well, trebuchet, usually. Trebu but... Trebuchet. Okay, yeah, so, there you go. so everyone has seen a trebuchet, but not everyone knows what that word trebuchet means. How do you how do you describe it to people when, like, I know what I would say, but how do you describe it to people? Well, when first, they I want to know you? what you would say. What would you say? I would say it's like a catapult with a rope on it that <laughs> like makes the rope spin around, and you've seen Braveheart and. Game yeah. Of thrones and stuff. Yeah, I uh, what I would say to people is it's that big thing that throws stones at the end of Lord of the Rings because I think yeah. everybody has seen Return of the King now and that thing that that swings down a big weight that throws a stone from the other side off a rope like you're saying that's a trebuchet and there's a really big one at the beginning of Outlaw King for people who want to see like a really big one that was based on one that was actually built for that siege. And uh, even though the people in the castle, in Stirling Castle, surrendered, Edward I, who was besieging the castle, was like, no, we worked so hard on this trebuchet, we just want to use it. <laughs> <laughs> so they actually threw a couple stones at the castle, and then they were like, okay, you can surrender. So it's that big swinging uh, rock thrower. That's a trebuchet. So they showed up with the trebuchet. Yeah. And the other people were like, no, thank you. We yeah. surrender. And they're like, but come on, look at this thing. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it had a name. It was called Warwolf. And the people at uh, Sterling Castle were like, oh, no, no. <laughs> they're like, well, we just want to use it. Like, just let us use it a couple times. <laughs> then you can surrender. So, yeah, it's at the beginning of Outlaw King because it's just such a cool story. Interesting. Um. So how did you, first off, do you, do you go to, uh, Renaissance fairs or do they drive you crazy with their inaccuracies <laughs> or what, what's your vibe? I don't tend to go to them all of that much. They can be fun, but like, you can't expect any accuracy there. It's just playtime for grownups, you know? Do so you, can you go sober? I, Cause I feel <laughs> like I was, there's one, there's one, I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina right now. And I looked at uh, one popped up somewhere. I love a good sans. And uh, I looked and there's one like four hours away in Charlotte, but it's also sober October. And I'm, I happen to be doing that this year. Yeah. And I'm like, how am I going to go to a Renaissance fair <laughs> and not get hammered on mead, which to me is, <laughs> Uh, if I don't get drunk enough to consider buying like a sword or some sort of medieval weapon, then I I don't I don't know why I would be at a Renaissance fair. I well, feel like I mean, that's an important part of it. That and throwing tomatoes at the person. <laughs> and, uh, well, see, that's an interesting point. See, like drinking beer and meat is very medieval, but they didn't have tomatoes in medieval Europe. So you couldn't throw a tomato at anybody. They're from the Americas. So yeah, tomatoes are not a thing. That's a lie. I've been, I've been throwing lies at people's faces yes. while they taunt me. Yes. Yeah. No tomatoes, <laughs> no tomatoes, no turkey, no corn, no potatoes, no chocolate, no coffee. None of these things are medieval. So if you go to medieval times, and I hope they don't sue me for this, they know this already. Like that tomato soup that you get, the potato, like that, no, that's medieval. The corn, no, because they didn't have it. <laughs> what would be more authentically medieval if, if you, if you, you're you in charge of a Renaissance fair and it's yeah. going to be a lot more accurate? Right. Well, you could still have things like chicken. Um, but okay. you can't have turkey legs. You can't have the bi the big turkey leg that's only <laughs> at Renaissance. You can't even get those things anywhere else, and they're only at Renaissance fairs. I and know. it doesn't even it's not historically accurate. Well, that's like what you're telling Renaissance, me. if we're talking like Henry the Eighth, uh, people had discovered the Americas by then. But if we're talking about like medieval, like Columbus is sailing in 1492, and that's like the very end of the medieval period. People weren't like eating turkey legs during medieval, the medieval period, actually. So you would be eating stuff like a lot of similar vegetables, but you'd mostly be eating things like, you know, sheep, you'd be eating mutton, <laughs> you'd be eating um, cereals, right? So you make yourself a pottage, you'd be eating dark bread, unless you're really rich and then you'd have white bread. But Ooh. yeah, no turkey legs. 
Uh, you you a mutton fan or me personally? Not so much. <laughs> What Maybe is, that's why you don't see me at those. <laughs> what, what's, what is mutton again? I, I'm sure that I've had a mutton it's before. <laughs> it's cheap. Oh, well, that's not bad. It was like, so it's like a little bit of a gamier yeah. taste or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I must have had mutton at some point. <laughs> well, you um, probably had lamb, right? You could have that in the Middle Ages. So there you go. So do you have, so you have a trebuchet. Do you have other like is your like how because you have four books about medieval times correct mm-hmm. yeah. so do you have is like your house a castle or <laughs> is it do you or is it just do you compartmentalize how yeah. it, does it all go into the reading and the writing or is your whole house made up like this do you live the <laughs> do you live the med- i mean you have a trebuchet in your backyard which i'm still saying incorrectly i believe uh, no, but no, you good. have it you have it in your backyard. You have to. That can't be the only medieval thing that you have. Well, I built a trebuchet. We fired it off into like a wood lot, <laughs> but I don't still have it. <laughs> and then you no. got rid of it. Yeah. Wait, what? Well, what are you gonna do with it? It is. It's a weapon. It's dangerous. Uh-huh. I'm not sure it was totally legal for us to actually be building and shooting it. But yeah, you can't just keep a weapon around and. What? Uh, <laughs> I think you can have one in your back. In your back. Yeah. (laughs) They are actually really dangerous because if you don't get things just right, they can backfire. And that actually happened to us when we built it. It backfired and and almost, well, (laughs) we had lit it on fire. (laughs) Yeah. The the projectile, because of course you do, right? And it Uh, backfired and it almost lit one of our friends, which is why kids, you shouldn't be doing this at home. So you have to be really careful with those things. So yeah, I don't have it anymore. All of it goes into the writing. I'm actually very boring and I don't have, I don't live in a castle. I don't have a lot of Uh, that stuff around the house because it's work, right? You do have to compartmentalize. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I mean, I still, yeah, I don't think I have any kids listening to this show, but if I do, (laughs) that kid is building a trebuchet, whether you tell them to (laughs) Or not. Well, when they do. Because now, you, now you've opened up the possibility. <laughs> Most people see that in a movie and you're like, no one could do that. How hard was it? What went, I mean, what went into it? It is hard because you have to, because it all has to work properly, right? And the hardest part was the sling because this is basically a sling, just bigger. So if you get the sling so it doesn't slip off the throwing arm correctly, it will backfire or it'll shoot straight up. And we were building a small one, right? Like the ones that people were, <laughs> the ones who, we were, who would have, you see one of these things and you don't suspect that very many things could possibly go wrong with it. But then you hear more and you're like, well, maybe these things are a little bit dangerous. Yeah, they are. Well, they are dangerous, but once you calibrate them, right, once you've got that figured out, they're super, super accurate. So we were shooting, so our trebuchet was about maybe seven feet tall, which is small, That's, small, small. Yeah. The ones who that were used in medieval warfare, those like buckets that held the weight held about two tons. So it's huge, it's a difference. But our little seven foot trebuchet threw a stone, you know, about the size of, I don't know, a, a small artis- artisanal loaf of bread. It threw it about uh, 70 feet and it hit the same box over and over again. They're really, really accurate once you get it set up. But like you have to be, you have to work really hard to make everything work properly or you're going to get a rock shooting straight up and that's not what you want. So kids, (laughs) the kids who are listening, like try with like, a Nerf ball or something. You could get little kits to just make tiny rock, ones. Just shoot straight up into the air and then everyone runs for their lives, That's I right. imagine. Yes. This is why people sometimes will shoot, like sometimes people have built them and they shoot like pumpkins, which is a safer bet, but you still don't want a pumpkin, you don't want a pumpkin going on straight your down on your head. No. no. So you have to be really careful with these things. They are weapons. Yeah, well, that's good. I, I've been trying to get the word out there about trebuchet safety, and so you're definitely the person. <laughs> that's to talk right. To. Yeah, that's what um, I do in my spare time is I go to schools and I talk about trebuchet safety. <laughs> um, I uh, so so how did you get into medieval studies? Accidentally, really. I mean, like I was a kid who read stuff about Robin Hood and stuff about King Arthur when I was a kid. And I was really into it. 
Um, but I didn't know I was going to be a medievalist. One day I, I had taken a class at university about medieval romance, which is just basically like Arthurian stories. Romance stories are just stories that were not written in Latin. They're written in the romance languages, right? So French, Italian, Spanish. And uh, I didn't know you could do that as a career, <laughs> but it just kind of came to me one day accidentally that I wanted to do that. So I went and did a graduate degree and learn more about it. And then I've been working on medieval studies ever since. Um, so when were, what, what years were the medieval times? So around 500 to around 1500, people are always, they always choose their own dates, but it's around a thousand years, at least in Europe, between around 500 to around 1500. So we're talking about like the quote unquote fall of the Roman empire to about the rise of Protestantism, the Reformation. So that's mm. the thousand year period, which is a huge period. A lot of things happen during that time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I thought it was like a couple hundred years. In my mind, it wasn't that long. Yeah. It's a really long period. Um, and so, yeah, I, hmm, I, have, a, I have several questions. I, <laughs> I guess one thing I was thinking about kind of related to something else recently was was the impact of of writing on human culture and it wasn't I, I, we were just talking about kind of the uh Hammurabi code one of the yeah. first kind of written um texts be, when they started actually writing things down that weren't just accounting for crops or or whatever and and the impact that that had and like a written set of rules and then some of the early organized religions came uh right after that it was just the importance of because even even to this day when i'm when when i have a guest on they're like whoa they've written a book <laughs> like i've tried writing books they're hard but anyone can <laughs> write a book yeah but but there's a there's a like uh there's a thing about it. Like uh, I, I tour with um, live science and comedy shows and stuff sometimes. And, and uh, I could have someone with a MacArthur genius grant and no one would care or know what that is. And then the next person would have some self-published book and people would be like, they have a book. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And yeah. so this must've been really impactful when like papyrus or whatever was incredibly difficult to come by and there weren't many of these things around. And I know kind of the origins of, of universities, as I understand where they just didn't have many books around. So you just, the professor is just someone that would read a book to everybody because mm -hmm. they would have books kind of touring around a country or, or whatever. <laughs> and that's, that's how you would share that information because not everyone could just read a book. Um, what was, what was kind of the impact on um, writing and literacy? Because that would have been, I imagine that's a time when people started becoming quite a bit more literate in those thousand years. Yes. <laughs> so what you're getting at right at the end there is that this is a thousand years. So it's a very long period. So if we're talking about the quote unquote, I'm going to keep putting in quotations, the fall of the Roman Empire, then you have individual kingdoms that are coming out of this, right? And so it eventually grows into what we're thinking of as Europe now with its individual countries. But over this time, people started to teach each other educational stuff, right? So it's not like people forgot how to read in this time, but there was stuff going on. So mm -hmm. most of the reading that was happening was happening in monasteries. That's where you would get educated and that's where you would get taught. And then eventually you could go to universities, although monasteries and cathedral schools were still where you're getting to learn how to read. Most people, most people weren't literate in the sense that we think of it now in that reading and writing were considered separate skills. So you might know how to read, but you might not know how to write. So these are two different mm. things. And so there are quite a few people who could read that we might think of as people who were illiterate. They could read some things, but they weren't people who are going out and writing a book. You know what I mean? The major shift happened. Two things happened, really. Um, people started to, to make paper, which is originally made from linen, and then it started to be made from pulp. And this is something that came to Europe in the 1400s for the most, sorry, the 
in the 1300s, for the most part, people started to pick up the use of paper. There's actually a podcast I did about paper. If people are interested in that. But before that, people are writing on vellum. So this is animal skin that has to be like tanned and it has to be scraped and it has to be bleached and then you can start to write on it. So all of the books that people are using are being copied by hand. And so if you're a university student, you could still get a book, but they were expensive because of all the labor that went into them. So when it started to transition into paper, that made a huge difference. And then of course the printing press was invented around the 1470s. And that's when it made it possible for more people to get more books. And then it made it possible for more people to have more schooling using books. And then more people became literate over time because I think in large part, because the printing press made it more affordable for people to actually have books. So like the evolution of like reading and books over time is like, it's a huge, it's a huge period over which a lot of things happen. But basically people were writing on animal skins until well into the 1400s, people are still writing on animal skins for the most part. And then as the printing press became a thing, then it started to be more paper and more cheap books for people to read. And that was right at the end of yeah, uh, the, end. Yeah. The, the printing press just ended the, <laughs> I mean, not, what, not really. what was it? No, I, I, I imagine that's not the case, but what, what was, uh, what were the medieval, te- what, why do we call it that? Why is it, um, it also feels like, um, like a thousand years, it feels a little sloppy historically to be like, ah, we'll just that thousand years, that'll be medieval times. Well, <laughs> it's, it's a... The answer is actually propaganda, right? Because okay. you've been using the word Renaissance quite a lot, which means rebirth. And so when people were becoming Protestant, uh, in the 1500s, they really wanted to forget about the time when everybody was Catholic, which is the Middle Ages. And so uh, they were really interested in antiquity. They thought all the smart people were in the ancient period. I'm sorry were, I keep on saying medieval times. I mean to say Middle Ages. I you can to, say it's fine. Both of them are fine. Can? Okay. <laughs> yeah. As long as you're not like trademarking like capital medieval times, then you're fine. But yeah, so basically the people in the 1500s and later were just patting themselves on the back. So they were like, that stuff that happened in the middle when everybody was Catholic, like forget about that. It was all superstition. We want to think about the ancient Greeks and ourselves. So that was called the middle period really early on. Like I think the late 1400s or 1500s, people calling it the middle period because they were like, let's just forget about that. People were dumb during that time. And we've continued to say that Mm. (laughs) even though huge amounts of technological innovation was happening. People were, you know, reading more often, more books being circulated, more science, all this stuff happening. But it was really, it was a propaganda thing. And we are still buying into it. We still think like the Romans were amazing. And then things got amazing after the Middle Ages, but the middle was all like blue filter and mud and blood. And that's not how it was. Huh. And, and so what was, what was the kind of, I guess, characteristic of the beginning of so so that was that was the end of the middle ages right. or yeah. what we call the middle ages what was the beginning of it the beginning of it is really hard to pin down because there aren't a lot of sources that still exist you ought to remember that we're talking about like a millennium and a half and these are materials that can sometimes be damaged like literature it can be damaged and you can't get hold of it. The Vikings are not like super into books. They would like take the bejeweled covers off a book and like toss the book in the mud. Like they didn't care. And so, you know, you can lose a lot of material. So the, that early part of the middle ages, the quote unquote dark ages is hard to pin down because of that. We don't have a lot of sources from that time, but it was a tumultuous time because you had, uh, the Roman empire had kind of like connected much of Europe. And then when they receded, when the Romans pulled back, you have people that are migrating from all over the place and trying to take what they could get, right? Picking over the carcass of what the Romans have left behind. So everybody is establishing their own kingdoms, their own cultures, things like that. So it's it's not exactly a chaotic time because when you read sources from that time, it's just human beings being human beings, but it is hard for us to get in touch with that what that was like. So when we have sources, 
we like to like jump onto them, especially if they're sensational, right? Like the Vikings are just one group of people that were living at that time, but because their stories are like so sensational, this mm-hmm. is what we want to hold on to. So basically what was it like? It was regular people like farming and talking to each other and like just living their everyday lives. That's what it was like. Hmm. Um, well, yeah, I guess, I, I, I guess I would like to, before we get into, um, a couple of your books, uh, more specifically, can you add any other kind of middle ages 101 uh, for us to kind of set up, uh, set up anything else that kind of people need to know? Um, um Well, basically, I would say if it sounds outlandish, then it's probably not true. So things like the Middle Ages is known for torture devices, and most of those are actually not real. They're Victorian fakes, like the Iron Maiden, the Pair of Anguish. All of these things are, they're not, chastity belts are not real. They're just, Chastity belts aren't real. They're not real. No. (laughs) One time, a guy, well, one time a guy was like, wouldn't it be cool if when we travel, because people traveled a lot, that's another myth, <laughs> wouldn't it be cool if we could just put these on our wives when we leave? It was just and some so, comedian at the time yeah. that, was, uh, that had this silly idea. Yeah. So like, if it sounds crazy. And then they crazy, started making drawings and things, and then that became... So yeah. it was just a joke that went out of, uh, that like, got out of control and became known as, like common knowledge i thought there was chastity belts i i believed i swear i've seen like that in science books before that there's yes. chastity belts yeah yeah because because people are just super into the idea that the people before us were dumber right we just we love that it makes us look good so yeah. Yeah, and you don't know about I mean, chastity it belts. You, I know I feel like an idiot. It's like, of <laughs> course, how are you going to go to the bathroom? And so what? <laughs> so, what a stupid concept. Of course, they weren't real. Right. Yes. No, they're not real. But I mean, that's what people think about this time is that it's brutal well, and stupid, and it's really not. You don't well, know about me. it because you haven't read you haven't read my books yet. <laughs> I know I haven't. I just found out about you like a couple of days ago. I'm so happy you were able to uh, join me on such short notice because uh, I found out that we had this uh, conference coming up and I mm-hmm. wanted to direct people to it. And and um, and also some of your stuff is sort of relevant to what Athena and I are are working on uh, as well. But I, I you got to give me there. You got to give me a torture device or two. There had to have been. There was something. There was uh, they, they, um, they weren't waterboarding people. There there had to have been something there. Yeah, there was no they I don't weren't. get any torture devices anymore. I'll give you the wheel. Okay. So the wheel I'll is something wheel. that you would break people's bodies on. I'm not sure that this is medieval. <laughs> it might be earlier than that, but but the wheel is something that is associated with Saint Catherine. So it has been associated with her you know, since the beginning. What's what's the wheel again? So this is when you would like break people's bodies to like, I don't really know how it works. (laughs) You you haven't built one in your backyard? No, it's a torture device. (laughs) I only build weapons. Come on now. Okay. Okay. But here's the thing. You don't need to work very hard to torture a person. Right. You don't have to work very hard. You can. That's use... what people forget about is how easy it is to torture a person. Right. Many times you just leave them in a room and don't feed them, and that'll do the trick. Yeah. So I've done I've done a podcast on torture as well. There's a really great scholar people can learn from. But torture is actually not used a lot in the Middle Ages because what they knew was people would say anything under torture, right? So you could only use it under very specific circumstances. You could never use it. If somebody had accused one other person, you had to have like corroborating evidence that this person had done something wrong. And only in those cases could you use torture. But in different places like England, you weren't allowed to use torture because the confession you got out of it would be worthless. So Mm. this is another thing where if you actually look at the scholarship, the torture thing falls apart as well. So sorry, I have only bad news for you. I've been living a lie. (laughs) 
only bad news for you. <laughs> so you've written four books just yeah. trying to tell people that the Middle Ages are way more boring than they realize, yeah. essentially. <laughs> well, they're not. That's the thing. They're not more boring, but they're much they're just more boring. familiar. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, they're more they're more familiar and they're more. I mean, that's it's the. Uh, you know the human the human mind loves uh like gossip and attaching to big like you said this sensational fiery violent hyper salient type things and yeah. this is i mean this is how myths evolve and and yeah. uh and everything else and it it is it there and there's also some it, that's weird too and cuz because we both go, we tend to go, oh, well, this thing was old, so it was sacred and magical. And then at the <laughs> end, they knew everything and they were wise and could foresee the future um, and had were better at philosophy or whatever else than we are now. And then at the same time, we look at other periods and go like, what a bunch of horrible, violent dummies that yeah, couldn't yeah. read and they just tortured each other. Yeah. instead of reading yeah well it's in part i think because the more we think about how similar we are to that time the more uncomfortable it gets right so if we talk about like the ways you can torture people like this stuff was happening you know it's happened in the last couple of decades right you can see headlines in the newspaper about people being tortured and when we think about that <laughs> It makes us yeah. not look good, not comfortable. So yeah, it's much more, well, it's much more comfortable for us to look back and be like, those people are dumb. We've evolved so much since then. That feels really good. So I, I can see why there's a lot of appeal in putting all of our garbage <laughs> into just a few centuries, well, right? Well, yeah. Do you, I mean, do you think some of it is like, like you said, it's hard to have records of some of the stuff, um, because say I wanted to make a case for there being more torture back then because right. I want it to be that way in my mind. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so I, I would say, well, you know, you look at like Guantanamo Bay and sure we have these like Polaroid photos of, of like naked human pyramids to humiliate them or whatever. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. like that, well, yeah, you have this physical evidence, but perhaps they just like couldn't get people to sit still long enough to paint the <laughs> naked pyramid to humiliate them or whatever back then. Well, Maybe there just wasn't the the evidence, the 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 you know the physical um, records that uh, uh, that showed evidence of it. Well, that's funny because. I got to send you one of my books because I'm pretty sure I have a manuscript image in one of my books that has somebody that is hanging from something called the strapado, which basically is just hanging from your arms so that your joints are overextended. And I think that the person, the torturer is applying fire to them. But honestly, I don't know if that is torture or punishment because punishment is different from torture, right? Uh. So, but yeah, I have, there is a, an actual picture of people took the time to draw it out. There is a, <laughs> people have also taken the time to draw out like Can those, you wiggle less while yeah. you're being burned, please? Right, right. So, but the legal records are where we find information about torture or punishment. And if somebody is believed to have been, you know, terrible, then people will write about it as if this is a good thing or right. they'll write about it as if it's a terrible thing, but they will write about it. So- Legal records are some of the best records that we have. So, what kind of fun punishment did they have going on back then? Cause well, the there's one because <laughs> there's, there's, everyone thinks of like the guillotine and stuff, and yeah, and, uh, the guillotine is post medieval. So, if you were gonna get beheaded, <sighs> yeah, sorry, man, if you were gonna get beheaded in the middle ages, people would use an axe. <laughs> I, I uh, no, all of my Middle Ages information from movies, it turns out, that are not historically accurate in any way. Yes, you're going to uh, have trouble watching movies from now on. What <laughs> I'm about sorry the about that. what about the uh, what do they call them the stocks or whatever where they put yeah. people in their hands and their the public humiliation stuff? Yeah. They had to come on. Yeah. They had yeah. To, they did yeah. a little bit of they that. They did that. Right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and they did that 
more oh, afterwards. And more they afterwards. More okay. afterwards than during the Middle Ages. Well, but they invented it then maybe i mean i don't know did the ancients not have a place to put people to humiliate them i bet they did so i don't know (laughs) i don't know that's not something i have looked into (laughs) yeah but um you're talking like the worst execution you could have and it was meant to be the worst execution you could have was one being hanged drawn and quartered so this is one where oh, boy. you would, so in the Middle Ages, people. It's like what they did to William Wallace in the movie, that's right? right? Yes. So it was. It that was, is. <laughs> there was a thing you found like the almost. one historical detail in that movie. <laughs> yes. Uh, so you would be hanged by the neck. So they didn't have a trap door to break your neck. If you were hanged in the Middle Ages, you strangled to death. Oh, my. So you would be hanged. Okay. Then you'd be cut down. Then yeah. you would be drawn by horses till your joints okay. gave. You would be disemboweled and that would be the entrails would be burned in front of your eyes. And then you would be executed by beheading. Now, this is not. Well, it's pretty good. I mean, if you want to like really make an impact on people, that's, like, that's exactly a horrifying. Right. That's one of the worst things I could uh, imagine that's ever happened to anyone in all of human history. That's was right. When that happened. Oh, I forgot the castration. You're castrated too. Um, oh yeah. So this happens there. I did a podcast about this too. So this there's a there's like symbolism to all of these things, right? So it's not just like what can we do that's really going to be gross. It's about getting. It's about punishing that person for their traitorous ideas right so you're getting rid of that stomach because that's where some of your ideas to work against the king might be coming from you're separating the head from the body like you tried to separate the king from his people so like this is the worst punishment it's very symbolic it's not something yeah. that happened every day and so people when William, are throwing up watching this and they go yeah. well it's a metaphor come on it's not, <laughs> this isn't me being to, <laughs> well you think i want to cut this person's head off and disavow that i have to it's for the story sure. I'm sure it was explained during the yeah. execution, but it's meant to be hideous and gross. And we're still talking about it because it's horrific. So yeah. it's not something that happened every day. So, yeah, no. that was meant to be an example for the entire island of Great Britain when Edward did that to William Wallace. Like nobody, nobody rises up against me or this is what will happen to you. And I mean, we're still talking about it. So it's accomplish what it was meant to accomplish but yeah not an everyday thing you ask for the worst that's the worst it's a pretty good one as far as <laughs> bad, as far as bad things go that yeah. is that's more horrifying than a lot of the myth uh, the myths yep that didn't actually exist that is whew. yep um okay i need to reset my mind a little bit now <laughs> um well so so what about well, well, now I'm on this kick of, of I want to know all of the lies that I've been told. <laughs> mead? Do I get mead? You do. Absolutely oh. you do. Yes, you got mead. You got beer. You got wine. Yeah, that was, uh, that was uh, I think that was the origin of um, of honeymoons. I think it was uh, I think it was related to there was there was some custom and some culture where there was after the wedding night, the father in law would have to give his like son-in-law or whatever all of the all of the mead he could drink for a week or something like that <laughs> this is not something i'm familiar with so it's probably not a medieval european custom yeah. or i probably would have come across it before yeah yeah maybe yeah. it was before that or something i maybe. don't know um i i was oh boy what was i going to ask you about was the Oh shoot! Um, There's uh, a lot right. of myths. There's a lot yeah, of myths. Hit, to hit go me through. with some more myths. I I have other questions. I just had I had one in particular. It'll come back to me. So yeah, hit me with more myths. Well, the easiest one is that people didn't think that the Earth was flat. They believed it was a sphere. They knew it was a sphere. They hadn't lost the wisdom of the ancient Greeks, right? And the ancient Greeks had already figured it out. Mm-hmm. So they knew that the ancient Greeks have figured it out. It's like 40,000 kilometers is the circumference of the earth. And NASA says it's 40,070 kilometers. So that's pretty good. 
but they knew it was a sphere and you can find evidence of it everywhere. I did a TEDx talk and so I have like visual images in there, but they knew it was a sphere. Otherwise, astronomy wouldn't work. And they were mm. very, very into astronomy and astrology as well, which they thought was a science. <laughs> um, but they knew it was a sphere. Absolutely. When did, astro uh, when did astrology start taking off? Was that during the, because I, well before that time? I would say well I, before that time, because like the Zodiac is, is all like from Greek mythology, right? Right. So yeah. it's going to be older than the Middle Ages. Hmm. But this this is like not my area. <laughs> so. Oh, that's okay. Well, I I remembered the thing that I wanted to ask you, and now right. I know why my brain was trying to forget. It was about castration. Oh. Um, so, it, I I remember reading. I I think this was a cross cultural thing because um, I remember reading about some like Chinese emperor who would have a harem that would he would. Um, his enemy, he would castrate some of his enemies and then have the castrated men guard his harem. That mm -hmm. would be, mm -hmm. that's what would happen if you're enemies with this guy. Mm -hmm. He would get castrated and then you would have to guard like hundreds of fertile women for the <laughs> guy who castrated you. <laughs> Speaking of punishments, right? <laughs> yeah. Um. So, so, so castration was a thing during the... It was Middle. part of a hair, like a horrible punishment. Yeah. It wasn't an everyday thing. And there's nothing comparable that I can think of to that story. No. Uh, um, um, all right. Well, you have a, uh, you have the book. What's the, t the title of the, your most recent book? My most recent book is How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life. So... I would love to get into that a little bit. I've sure. always, I, I was raised Catholic. Um, <laughs> so, so this is the thing that they were like, th this was, this is the big, uh, Catholicism was huge during these middle ages. Then yeah. is, is what I'm taking yeah. from this. Yeah. This and is pre Protestantism. So here, so, you know, I'm still, I'm still processing my my Catholic upbringing, it didn't go well for me. <laughs> I I never really I wasn't all that into it. Right. Um, but in if, I I went from you know very angsty and rebellious and stuff in my youth to just, uh, I'm 42 now. I have I, I now I find a lot of the mythology and stuff through through history to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, and just the roles that it had on culture. So when did Catholicism first take off? Well, in the ancient period, right? So if we're, if we're counting like the year of our Lord being zero, <laughs> then it's pre-Middle Ages. Yeah, but the Bible wasn't even like 200 until like 200 years after that, like the first written Bible. And then, and then the, the different sects that happened was Catholicism wasn't the first one, right? But it was... See, it was like, just Christianity and then... When you name it Catholic... Well, there was only one way for a lot of Europe from the beginning, but there was also what we call Orthodox now, right? So there, there's the two different branches, but they're both what we might think of as like Catholicism now as in not Protest Protestantism, but like church history is not where I spend most of my time. But let's just say that from the beginning of the Middle Ages, um, Christianity's well-established, well-established. There's like all the literature you could want. There's like the Bible, there are the church fathers, right? St. Jerome, St. Augustine. So by the time the Middle Ages start, Catholicism is well-established. And does, does that answer your question? <laughs> I kind uh, of forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no, it does. I, I, I was so so Catholicism was well established by the Middle Ages yeah, already. Yeah, yeah, and then was there was there any kind of church and state separation? In in my mind, the church was the was the state and the law of the land, and and they were the ones collecting taxes and everything else. Kind of. Kind of. There wasn't really a separation between church and state because in order for you to be a king, 
you had to have God's blessing, right? So they really went back and forth and they argued amongst themselves, like kings and popes, like who is really in charge of my country? And eventually they settled on the fact that, okay, like the Pope is in charge of everything, but that can sometimes just be in name only, right? Like during the 1300s, there is the persecution of the Templars, for example. During this time, the Pope is in France and the King of France is like, bullying the heck out of the Pope. So even though the Pope is like the head of all of Christianity at this time, uh, at least in the Catholic tradition, like nobody necessarily had to listen to him all the time. And they didn't, (laughs) they didn't always, but this was something that they were actively debating because how much power belongs to who is a very important question when you're trying to administer a realm, for example. So The thing that makes it also complicated is that kings would have jurisdiction over some laws and the church would have jurisdiction over other ones. So things like like murder, like theft, uh, these were under the king's law. But things like adultery, blasphemy, these were under the church's law. Mm. So there's two different laws going on. And this is actually something that caused a huge problem because... For example, if you were a priest, you couldn't be charged under the king's law. So if you were a priest that murdered somebody, you couldn't get hanged for that (laughs) because you're a priest. The church would take care of that and the church would punish you by saying like, you need to fast for this amount of time or whatever. And so the kings found this very unfair. (laughs) They argued about this quite a lot. And this is one of the things that led to the murder of Thomas Beckett, if people have heard about that was because Uh -uh. of an argument between the king and the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Beckett. Uh, The king wanted the Archbishop on his side when he was trying to bring laws together, for example, and the Archbishop was like, heck, no, we're not going to do that. So um, the king said, well, well, nobody rid me of this turbulent priest. And then people took that literally and actually, you know, murdered the Archbishop and then King had to apologize I'll for that. I'll reduce a few people for just yeah, like, like okay. I'll do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the the king had to apologize on his knees, uh, and he had to be like flogged by people on the way to the cathedral to apologize. This is Henry the uh, Second of wow. England. So it was a big deal. So the king tried to take oh, all the power, wow. uh, that's, and the pope not, won that it's one. It's not every day you get to flog a king, <laughs> right? So the pope that's a won fun that one. Day. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was, there is no real separation of church and state in that it's very messy the way that it works together. Um, but this is something that was, people were arguing about during the entire middle ages. So in, in my mind, um, the, uh, the King's uh, the King James Bible was, uh, was kind of rewritten uh, or King James had someone uh, like sort of rewrite it to essentially give the king more power in that Bible. But that was, I think that was like 16, that was just after the middle ages or, yeah, or so something, that's, but I'm yeah. sure there was always the push and pull. Yeah. Going yeah. On. Because everybody wants all the power, right? So if you're ah, Pope, you want to be me. in charge of everything. I just but want a little of power. I'll just take a <laughs> smidgen of power. Everyone just, else, yeah. you guys can have the rest. Just a touch. Yeah. <laughs> I want, I want like a, you know, I want a, a backyard trebuchet. There you go. Of, amount of power. You can do that yourself. I, <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say to you, buy one of the little kits for children. The little kits for children. Don't start throwing pumpkins or like bowling balls. <laughs> and then study that how it bad. works, and then build one. Yeah. Okay. So. So what what got you what got you interested in um monks and monastery life? Well, this was actually a concept that a publisher brought to me. So I've been writing for a, a long time now, writing lots of articles and writing a couple of books and the publisher came to me and they said, "We have this idea about like bringing monastic life to modern life. Do you think this would be a project that you'd want to do?" And I was like, "I've always wanted to learn more about monks because I think they're pretty fascinating." So yeah, I'll I'll do this. And so I took this on as a, an interesting way for me to bring history and psychology together because I'm really interested in psychology as well. So you're talking about like, I don't have a castle that I live in, 
when I'm in my off time, I'm reading psychology. <laughs> I don't read like more middle ages, that's work. So I could bring these things together in the book and that's, that's what I did. So the concept was not mine, but the execution of it was mine. Yeah. And how uh, monks were probably quite a bit different than, than uh, uh, now you think of like Buddhist monks when you think Mm -hmm. of monks, Mm -hmm. but um, back then it would have been, uh, I imagine monks had a great deal of power and, sway in things back then. Sometimes, right? sometimes, right? So we should say that Buddhist monks still existed, but just in the part of the world I wasn't looking at, right? So mm-hmm. Christian monks, it's tricky because they were meant to be separated from society uh, in order to be more perfect in their faith, but they weren't really. So they were landholders. So a monastery might own a bunch of land. They might have tenant farmers, uh, the abbot might be somebody who was from the nobility and they might be schmoozing people to make sure the monastery was funded or things like that. So they're not as separated from the world as they intended to be, but the intent was to be very separate. So that all they did all day was to focus on God and on their faith. So they were integrated, but they were meant to be separate. And some of them actually did achieve that. But most of the time, they weren't super... Most of the time they weren't super powerful, but some cases they were because of the connections that an abbot might have or because of the land holdings that they might have. People would donate land, for example, to a monastery on their death so that the monks would be praying for them and make sure that their their souls went to heaven. So they they could amass quite a lot of wealth, which would make them powerful. But again, there's some small houses that didn't have much power at all. So it really depends on where you look. Hmm. I know this is like ruining all your ideas about the Middle Ages. I was just just thinking like, what a, what a great system. You just like, Hey, give me all your land when you die and I'll make sure you get to the good place. Yeah. I think that some, some people were that cynical and power hungry, but I think most of the time it was, it was faithful. Yeah. 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 And, and so what was, what was normal monastery life like back then? Right. So a monk's life was pretty challenging and it was meant to be challenging because you were like a spiritual athlete in some ways. So you would be praying uh, a lot of times over the course of the day, I think seven times over the course of the day. And in between that time, you would be working, right, to help the monastery. You might be working uh, in a garden or you might be working with a talent that you already have, like you're, you're a shoemaker, maybe you're repairing shoes. So you're working, then you're reading, then you're praying again. And much of this is done in silence. And you are not, you don't get to pick what you wear. You don't get to pick what you eat. You don't get to pick what you do every day. All of that is given to you as an assignment. Then you have to get up in the middle of the night to pray. And so monks are they have a difficult life, but this is something that was done on purpose. So when I wrote this book, I'm not saying people should be monks. That's very difficult, <laughs> but there are things we can learn from monks. Things like um, having green space. This is something that you find in cloisters, right? So if you ever visit a cloister, you'll find that it's usually built in a square. There's a church on one side, there's a dormitory, there's a place for them to eat. And in the middle, there is a green space and they're meant to spend time there to refresh their eyes after being inside all day, doing all their work, doing all their prayers. And this is something that, you know, science has shown us really makes a difference. Like 30 seconds looking at an artificial plant will make us happier. So this is the kind of stuff that I bring to the book. Not that you want to live a life that is as austere as a monk's, but adding things to your life like green space, for example, will be helpful. Hmm. Um, all right. Well, what else? If I'm, so I'm, I'm on this, I'm on this sober October, uh, kick. So, um, I, I started, I started early. So I started, uh, I got, uh, my COVID booster like a while back and I used that as an excuse to start a little early. That was the 23rd mm-hmm. of September. And then I, cause I just got into, I planned a festival this, uh, uh, this last summer and I got, uh, I got into, uh, the festival spirit, uh, pretty heavily. (laughs) And so I, 
so I I quit drinking, smoking, and um, watching TV, and then the stupid board game that I got myself addicted to, I quit all the same. You're not supposed to quit that many things at the same time. <laughs> no. Um, and then, but it's going really well. And then okay. I I quit uh, I quit um, uh, I deleted social media from my phone too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I can still check important direct messages or whatever on my computer. So mm-hmm. I'm on, and now I'm on, you know, now October just started. I'm on this wellness kick and I feel like this is the most monk like I've been in some time. So I would, I would like to know, like, I, I want some, uh, like, modern self-help advice from <laughs> uh from a middle-aged monk perspective yeah well a monk would tell you you are right on track you should be limiting or at least not overdoing it on anything whether that's alcohol they didn't have cigarettes back in the day that tobacco was from the america so they didn't have that either no pipes <laughs> just so you know all the people who are like super into Tolkien, there's no pipes in the actual middle ages but they would say moderation is important for everything. And sometimes you need to deprive yourself in order to be healthier, right? So fasting was something that they did quite a lot. And this was a way to make them healthier. So I wouldn't say like fasting is something that you should do. Yeah. It's one of the things where fasting, (laughs) Uh, but that, but that was a regular practice was, and you're talking about just on food fasting or, or was that like applied to, like substances or sex or like whatever, Uh, when they used the word fasting, what did it mean? It could mean different things. So that's a really good question. First of all, there's no sex. They're they're monks in a monastery. So celibacy is- Oh, that was always a thing? It was always always a a thing. How did that take off in the first place? (laughs) Where where, uh, people were like, I have this idea for a way that we should live our life no sex and yes. people are like okay it never works that way so I always like uh like a more mormonism was like uh joseph smith or whatever was ran out of town after town after town and uh, like put in jail and stuff for misleading people and being like a fake treasure hunter and then doing all of these things and and no one believed a word he said until <laughs> until uh uh, like one day his wife caught him cheating and he was like, oh, God says I can have multiple wives. And then they adapted that practice. And then, and then Mormonism took off faster than any religion in human history, mm-hmm. because I imagine the guys would be walking down the street with a couple of women or what people would be like, what's your, what's your secret? I'd be like, Well, there's this new religion that I'm into. You're like, you know, I've been looking to get into more s- spirituality <laughs> lately. Uh, and then, but so, but the monk cell, that's a tough cell. That's yeah. what. It's supposed to be difficult, right? So if you become a monk, you are, uh, you are vowing poverty, chastity, and obedience. So this is what I mean. You, you get told what to do and you don't talk back. Your abbot tells you what to do. And this is what you're giving to God, right? This is a... This is a challenge that you're facing because you are trying to have faith. But I mean, you were raised Catholic. You haven't heard that like sex is a bad thing for people. Well, to be yeah, doing. yeah. But I didn't know that, that. I didn't know if that was a thing that came around later for the monks or if it no. was just right from Jump Street. Right from the were, beginning. If it's wow. something you enjoy, you shouldn't be doing That's crazy. <laughs> as a monk. <laughs> Wait, how did monks start? <laughs> how did they start? Good question. Yeah. Well, um. They started out as hermits, but people realize that being a hermit is really <laughs> is really hard. It's really hard to be a hermit. Um, so they're like, you know what? I have these goals, I have these spiritual goals. You have spiritual goals. So like they're accountability partners. So they became groups of people who all had the same goals, which were to live a life that was like totally stripped down. That was like not about money. That was not about sex. That was not about pleasure. It was about just spirituality so like these are people with goals that had accountability partners that's how monks got started wow yeah yeah that's interesting (laughs) so hermits would approach one another just an odd thing for a hermit to do and then they'd be like i see that you're also (laughs) 
<laughs> spending a lot of time indoors not talking no. with anyone maybe we can help each other out it's more like know. it's more like <laughs> it's, you're sitting together you know drinking a cup of wine out of a clay cup or something in the ancient period and you're like you know what i really want to be a hermit but it's hard i don't know if i can do it and then your friend is like i really want to be a hermit too and i don't know if i can do it so then they get together yeah. and they become monks. So it's not like hermits who are like sending smoke signals. <laughs> it's like people <laughs> who want to be that spiritual, but they don't think they could do it by themselves. Well, it wasn't smoke signal in my brain, but now it is. <laughs> uh, but that's, well, that's interesting. So then they'd be like, well, let's, let's meet up once a week, once a month or something like that. And that's just, we'll be the only We'll only talk to each other and we'll just hash out how to only talk to each other. And even maybe if we're lucky, talk to each other less. <laughs> it's more like, um, let's do it. Let's be monks. Let's be like hermits, but hermits together. And then they go out and they build a community that is just them like farming, you know, being silent or only talking about spiritual matters. And then this became, it became so popular that they had to start writing rules about like how to be a good monk. So the rule of St. Benedict came out, I think, sixth century, and it informed like monastic traditions up to this day. Like there are people still living by the rule of St. Benedict today. There's Benedictine monks out there, but you probably don't run into them every day because they are doing their, their monkly thing, which is not really interacting too much with the outside world. Although, you know, things have changed a little bit in the modern world. Hmm. <laughs> just like the people who are just listening to this and not watching the video are not going to be able to understand like, the face away. that you keep making this face at me. <laughs> I know. I love, I love all this stuff. I mean, I just, I, I, well, it's just, so, so I study a lot of evolution on the show right? and I, I tell people all of the time, I know nothing about modern human history. I don't, I never cared about, you know, like, American history or whatever is like the, you know, most people that are like, I'm really into history is like, that means they like World War II documentaries or <laughs> I know, or it's always me in the bookstore uh, with guys uh, who are looking for books. <laughs> yeah, and so that's what history means to most people. And I'm like fascinated in the, you know, going back, you know, billions, millions of years or, or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and so I know nothing about any of this stuff and it's so fascinating <laughs> so everything that i know is from tv and of course it's like that's going to make a fool out of anybody if yes. you get your information about anything from a, a <laughs> bunch of like hokey action movies or whatever yeah um yeah yeah i mean there's entertainment but you shouldn't take that as gospel for mm. sure for sure but i mean there's a lot of like medieval historians that are putting really good content out on the internet. And like my podcast has something that is interesting and quirky, hopefully interesting and quirky. What's the name week. of your podcast again? It's just called the medieval podcast because and it's, SEO, it's weekly, right? it's weekly. Every yeah. single week you're talking about medieval times. That's it's right. amazing. Yeah. Well, I talk to experts like yeah. you, so I know some stuff, but these people know more than I do. So we've talked about stuff like torture. We've talked about stuff like medieval pigs. We've talked about stuff like sex. We've talked about oh, just pretty much everything. So like there is good content out there, but yeah, you can't get it from the movies. We are still working really hard on that. <laughs> well, what about the, what about the weapons though? What's, what? what's, what's myth and what was reality with the cool weapons that you see? Do you get the, what's the, what, what's the ball spiky thing? So the ball spiky thing is called a flail. And that is the one thing that is contentious. So people are not sure that existed or if that was just a drawing again. But people did have maces that had a ball spiky thing on them. So you okay. could have a mace. Yeah. But most right. of the time people are using a sword. They might yeah. have a shield. They will always have a dagger with them. They might be using an axe. They might be using a pole axe. It depends on who you are. And if you can't afford these things, right? If you were just a farmer who got called up, you'd be using a pitchfork, you know. So there's a whole range of You weapons. don't have an axe. You're if a farmer, you, you don't have an axe. Hopefully, if you're a farmer, you have an axe. But maybe you want a ranged weapon, you know. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I mean, yeah. you can do a lot of things with an axe. You can cut down trees, make a canoe out of it. You could do all sorts yeah. of. You can chop things up. It's a. It's more versatile. I think if you gotta, <laughs> I think if you have to live your life and go to war and stuff, I feel like you go axe. If you're yep. just battling, you go sword. And then if you want to, if you don't want to actually be in a conflict and anyone fight you i feel like you go mace you do the crazy guy thing you, <laughs> i think that that's because why why would you swing around a ball uh it's it can hurt you right it's oh for sure yeah but still like it looks a little cool. hard to control it looks it looks very intimidating right? i think that you're hoping yeah. people don't call your bluff <laughs> If you have one of those. <laughs> it's true. It's true. But it's, yeah, again, back to like the simple, the simple will work. Yeah. So when people are talking about the zombie apocalypse, which is what we're going to be talking about yeah. in a couple of weeks, the simple weapons will work and Axe is going to do the job. Well, I, I just, I, I might, I might wrap things up because I want to have you back on sometime and maybe I'd have some time to actually, uh, since, since, since this came together um, so quickly <laughs> in last minute to promote the conference. Mm hmm um which uh check it out go to zombiemed.org that's where you want to get information mm -hmm. zombiemed.org it's october 20th through the 23rd arizona state university but they're also like streaming a bunch of things and stuff as well so you don't need to be there but you can also be in person and if you are i'll hang out with you so you should come and uh come and check it out because uh, also um why don't you plug all four of your books? But but one is one is per, uh, uh, particularly relevant to the conference. Right. Okay. So I wrote a book called The Five Minute Medievalist, which is a collection of essays plus a couple more that I wrote for the book. Uh, essays that I wrote for Medievalist.net, which is a place where people can find good information about the Middle Ages. So my first book was The Five Minute Medievalist. Then the se the secret book, which I'll come back to in a second. Then I wrote Life in Medieval Europe: Fact and Fiction, which is a book that is just there to answer your questions. So you can read it straight through or you can just pick out the questions you want answered. So the entire table of contents is just questions. People ask when they watch Game of Thrones. So, you know, okay. life in medieval So this Europe. is the one that I need the one so that, that we want. don't need to have the same conversation. <laughs> <laughs> now, then, wait, they, you're telling me this didn't exist. That's the book that you want. Yes, that's the book that, yeah, everybody who was watching Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, or reading a historical fiction book. That's the one you want is Life in Medieval Europe because it will answer your questions. Then How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life is the book that is about using history to help you maybe live a better life. And then the one we're talking about is uh, The Five Minute Medievalist Guide to Surviving the Zombie Apocalypse, which is a book I wrote very quickly. It's a very short book that talks about what we can use from the Middle Ages to help us in a post-electrical world. <laughs> so how do you build your defenses? What do you use for weapons? What do you use for medicine? Which is how I got involved with the zombie apocalypse medicine meeting back in 2020. Um, and all that kind of stuff is in the five minute medievalist guide to surviving the zombie apocalypse. Very cool. Hmm. <laughs> I think I do need to start with the fact or fiction one because it's also I also have um, the you know like I said I have the show Mind Under Matter and we just did this camp out festival it was a it was people loved it it was a big success we're going to do it next year but we're also like trying to think of more cult ish like uh, <laughs> silly things that we can do um, and so uh, like we. We were doing all sorts of weird. We built an outhouse from scratch and then made it, it like had artists paint it and stuff. And then we burned it at, at the end. <laughs> Maybe we'll use the, your trebuchet next year or you'll have to tell me who you sold that to. Um, and then so we're, we're trying to think of other like weird uh, things that we can do, but things that are like historically accurate. That's a that's a good fun um, that adds a little something to a, a, a festive time when you, when you, when there's some s historical story behind why you're doing some ridiculous thing. Mm -hmm. So I might start with that one. And That's then, a good one. And you could start with the medieval podcast, right? If you are not ready to just dive into a book, you can just look around and see if I've talked about anything interesting on the medieval podcast and start there. 
Terrific. Well, I, I can't wait to find out more. Um, it's Danielle Sibalski. That's C Y B U L S K I E. The links um, for her uh, books and podcasts will be in the uh, in the description um, wherever you're listening or watching this. And so, thank you, Danielle, for joining me. Thanks so much for having me on. And thank you listeners for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll talk to you next week.